Dr. Marian McCarthy is the director of the Center for the Integration of Research, Teaching and Learning at UCC and the Senior Lecturer in Education. She holds a PhD in the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning and is influenced by the work of Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and the Project Zero Classroom at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, where she spent a decade as a member of its summer, summer school faculty. <coughs> Marianne is responsibility for the accredited program in teaching and learning in higher education at UCC, including postgraduate certificate, we will hear about it later on from Marianne, postgraduate certificate, diploma, and <coughs> master's, which provides certification for staff, no, new idea for us, certification for staff who wish to research their teaching and their students' learning. She also directs the program for visiting scholars in the field of teaching and learning in higher education. Dr. McCarthy also has a keen interest in the arts, we visited the museum yesterday, and the role in education. She maintains links across the broad spectrum of teaching and learning in a variety of contexts, including the UNESCO Learning Cities Project. She is serving on the governing body of the UCC for the second time and is also a member of the Senate of the National University of Ireland. Please, Marianne. So Marianne's talk will concern what can we learn from investigating our own teaching, the case for sitting beside the student and investigating the learning. Thank you. Shalom. This is the first word uh, that I know. The second phrase that I know, I heard many times yesterday. It is about taking the right turn uh, off the roundabout. And I think it goes something like, Ne Yamina. <laughs> so I am learning um, so many phrases from it. <laughs> And um, so it is uh, a great pleasure for me to be here. My biggest problem will be to speak slowly. And um, they did offer me the opportunity to wander around because I love moving. But if I move, then I'll talk more quickly. So perhaps it's best I stay here. Um, now, I will get going, as it were, straight away. And then later we can chat a little more. Now. This interesting uh, aspect, as you say, of enhancing teaching through research, uh, these are the kinds of questions I'm constantly asking myself. What is the relationship, or indeed, what are the relationships between teaching, learning, and research? And these are many and complex, as, as Noah has pointed out. Um, and indeed, in the light of your president's opening words, uh, the ERA conference, I, I'm familiar with though, I tend to go to the ISOTL one, which is on a month or so later, and I can never get to both. Um, but again, the complexity of teaching, as you would see from that and other conferences, uh, is huge. Mm -hmm. And it is wonderful just for us to get in there and have the attitude that we are open to learning and um, open to critiquing and investigating. So many ways in which we can answer that question, and I hope by the end of this talk that you will have, uh, you know, maybe more interesting questions again, or at least some some answers. How do we document and research teaching and learning? And this, I suppose, is something that has preoccupied me um, when we are working with staff on the accredited program. How do we know the burning question that should be on all our tombstones? How do we know what our students know and understand? That is the big question, really. And that is where the research in teaching comes from. That's the impetus to it all. And I suppose, ultimately, 
I want today to, to have a look at that last question. How can we find a balance in our teaching and research lives so that we can live them more and enjoy our teaching and research? To me, it's all no good if we don't really enjoy it as well. If it's always a chore, your research drawing you one way and the teaching drawing you the other, and it's like a tug of war. So we have to find ways uh, to do this. <clears throat> and I will come back to some wonderful moments I have seen of it already this morning in this very building. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a picture of University College Cork on a sunny day. I say this because when Noah and Elena and Oslet were with me and we had a wonderful time together, they were freezing cold. And on the first day, Elena said, I cannot stand this. It is too cold. So again, um, yeah. but you see here, this is a traditional university in terms of the setting. It's there since 1845. And it shows you as well how in diverse, you know, in demanding times one can survive because 1845 was also the year of the famine in Ireland, which eliminated four million people. So despite that, uh, this building began and it, you know, you know yourselves in your own culture, the demands, um, you know, they can be very trying and difficult times. And yet, the thrust of education, the hope, the aspiration that somehow we'll move forward. Now, this is the main quadrangle, and there are 20,000 students now at UCC. Uh, about 5,000 of those would be postgraduate. And of that, there are 2,000 staff. And of the staff, administrative and academic, there are about 750 academics. And about another 250, let's say, researchers who come and go in projects. So we have about 1,000 in the faculty. And several of them at this stage have taken the certificate in teaching and learning in higher education. In fact, over 70% of them, the highest in the country. So we do have a way of getting them involved from the ground up. In fact, it's not compulsory to do the course, but more and more it has become so, because people naturally want to think about how they're teaching. Now, if you go through that little archway, I don't know if, yes, here, and down the other side of it, this is where I am. This is my little house, as it were, and it is like a little house. But I want to talk about that for a minute, the way in which it is linked to the university. Now, we are the point, as it were, of entry and of exit. It is the last building as you leave and the first as you come in. And I get all kinds of questions about, you know, have I seen the dog? And, you know, is somebody's mother or sister? <laughs> but this is good as well because it shows you the reality of, of, of life. But what's very important, you see in the background here, um, this building. Now, when you come through the archway that we just saw, the archway of the quad, this is the main, um, you know, as you pass down the side of it, this is the Ola Maxima and the council room. In other words, the seat of power of the university. And we were highly strategic mm -hmm. in getting space and place in that council room, where all the decisions that we make in governing body also happen. So I think that's part of my advice to you, and it's wonderful, Noah, that you have your centre here, and that the president and uh, the rector are so <coughs> um, welcoming of it, because it's very important that the teaching and learning centre itself has parity of esteem. Because otherwise, you know, if it's seen as the poor relation, then we'll never make progress. So this is the key thing about um, our centre. The, it's now called the Centre for the Integration of Research, Teaching and Learning, and I'll give you the link there. And it incorporates what Noah was speaking about, NERTEL, the National Academy for the Integration of Research, um, Teaching and Learning, which was the main project in Ireland for five years. The PRTLI cited it as the most important project to come out of the country in higher education. Um, so we are very lucky to hold the Nairtel archive and my colleague Dr. Catherine O'Malley and I work closely together in this. Um, so we have many programmes, I won't go into all of them, my main one is the accredited one, the Certificate Diploma and Masters in Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, in which now 70% of faculty have at least the first one. 
Now, what I want to come to now is, is this for a moment, and to engage you for one moment. Can somebody tell me when you look at that, what do you see? Just, just allow it. A glacier, perhaps. Now, some, some detail, some detail that you see. Well, footprints, exactly. Anything else? Yes, water. So, yes, okay. Shadows. Shadows, and therefore light. Okay, so let me tell you a little of this. This is the Tetrapod Trackway in Valencia Island in County Kerry. <clears throat> if you were a geologist, you would know uh, that it is 385 million years old. And all that time later, we can tell everything about that tetrapod <coughs> and about the geographical and geological conditions because he left his tracks in the sands and rock of time. And what I'm saying to you is this is precisely the challenge before us. How can we leave our tracks in the sands and rock of time? Because teaching the encounter, particularly the personal interactive encounter that we have in the classroom, it disappears like dry ice. <coughs> and unless you capture the conversations, unless you have a scribe in the class or get them to record and picture and photograph their space and critique it and also think through, as indeed Talib was doing this morning with her students, as she said, and she made some very revealing remarks uh, on no, <laughs> she didn't know I was listening, uh, when she said, well, you know, what a, how did I do it? I just stepped aside. I stopped getting in the way um, so that they could leave their tracks in the sands and rock of time, as you will see when you go out to see their project work. So it's about a trackway. Now, this is, I think, one of the things we forget. We're inclined to separate research and teaching. You know, I must get on with my research paper, and then the teaching is almost a second. Um, whereas we need teaching and learning belongs to everyone in the academy, not only to the educationalists, and I can say that because I am one of them. So it belongs to us all, whether we're in the arts department, whether we're in culture and society, or whether we are in the faculty of education. And indeed, often the faculty of education have the strongest um, challenge because they're so used to looking from the back of other people's classrooms that they forget to do the selfie and look at it themselves. <laughs> anyway, here is, I think, um, a context that you'll find useful. Our teaching, uh, the same, has all the criteria of good research. It should be public. But when you see often in the valley of the squinting windows in our teaching, nobody comes into your classroom. This is your domain, as it were. But here, we need it to be public, to open it up, to be susceptible to critical review and evaluation, and accessible uh, you know, for others, so that we can build on each other. And I love for that reason what I have done in UCC is to create the notion from the time our faculty come in of uh, the idea really, and move this a little this way, I think I might get more of an angle, on the critical friend. Because a critical friend is at once with you and, but not overly critical all the same. So we need, because some faculty, even those coming to my course in the autumn, some of them, um, you know, are, are nervous and they say, but I, I, you know, are you going to judge my teaching? I said, of course I'm not going to judge your teaching. That's for you to decide. This is not about remediation. It's about investigation. So nobody's trying to fix you. Uh, you're far too complex for that. So, but it's about investigation. So looking at that, keep that picture in mind, I find it useful as a reference point that it is about leaving our tracks, uh, as it were, in the sands of time. As we do in our research, you know, you open it up to others and you're quite, and indeed, as we see from Randy Bass, if you find a problem, all the better. Now, so, but the problem is on the left, as you see, the traditional, uh, mission of the university of teaching and examining research and scholarship and then engaging with the external community and it's as if the first two are totally separate you do the teaching and examining and then when you're free at two o'clock in the morning and at every weekend 
uh, you do the research. Hmm. But this is what is going to kill us. You have to think more of integrating the two so that you're, you know, the teaching is part of the research. Now, um, Ernest Boyer, in the United States, of course, they were more familiar with this argument than we were, as it were, about um, you know, 20 years earlier, at least. So in 1990, he and his colleagues in Carnegie wrote a book called Scholarship Reconsidered, which said, listen, we've had enough of this research going this way and teaching that way. People buy themselves out of their teaching. Uh, you know, and they think of research as desk research or research that you do in terms of quantitative research or to someone else, but not to yourself and not to part of your own classroom. And he, he mentions, you know, it goes through four different kinds of scholarship. That of discovery, which of course, uh, as we'll see in the next slide, that discovery includes, of course, <coughs> traditional research, but it also includes creative research. What Tally and our colleagues are doing this morning, that is research. There it is, and already I have pictured all of them. Documenting the research, making it visible and public. There you go. The art exhibition is a research instrument, but often we don't see it in that way. You know, we see that somehow as part of our teaching. But in your teaching, you're doing all the things you do as a researcher, hypothesizing, saying, if I do this, what's going to happen? What happens if I try that? What else is that but a research process? But we don't make it explicit or we're not confident enough to live that moment. Our identity as researchers is not totally fused with our identity as teachers. And I think that's the complex relationship that we need to kind of become more at home with. Also, he points out, um, Boyer, the scholarship of integration, all these new disciplines, bioinformatics, for example, or look at the work, Asenath, that you are doing in the light of bringing together new ways of working with technology and indeed with, with teaching. So that new, you know, the technological pedagogy uh, is a whole new field. So Boyer was conscious that we've got to celebrate as well and look at how we're integrating, in short, integrative learning. Things connect, bring the pieces of the jigsaw together. Also then, the scholarship of application, where we are in the community, or another and better word for it, is the scholarship of engagement. Where we are, you mentioned earlier, President, theory and practice. These should not be binary, and you mentioned, you know, about the, the casual clothes versus the um, foreman. Um, now, so therefore, which I think is interesting, theory and practice, one begets the other. Practice isn't the poor relation. And in a way, that's where the myth begins, that somehow teaching is a dexterous act that I do with my wrists and with my voice box. And the head, I'm not thinking. But of course, this is a myth. It's a Cartesian split, the body-soul dichotomy. But the two are one. We are one. You know, it is holistic. So therefore, the theory and practice in the community, we learn so much from the community. And finally, the scholarship of teaching. This is our main link as academics with our students. There will be no research tomorrow if we don't show them how to research, as it were. It, it's, it, this is our main form of dissemination. And somehow that is forgotten. And it's as if as well there's a misunderstanding that all of the money in the academy, in the universities, comes from research. No, all of the money actually comes from the students. That's where the main money is, the ones who are paying the fees. Mm. This madness of going off with it, I mean, great for you know, Horizon 2020 and for Erasmus, but in the end, it's all about how we make that real in the class. So then, in short, the teaching, learning, and research that we got caught up in at the beginning looks now a little more like this. Look at the part in the middle. Research-informed teaching, staff development, and explicit, we'll say, pursuit of, of equality, as you're doing here, in terms of diversity. And so therefore, there's a, new, there's a new Venn diagram where all the links come together, and where, in that sense, we are no longer separating teaching, learning, and research, but rather, they are integrated. Um, now, this of course, and I, again, I love this quote from Frank Rhodes that I just put up there, that we need our best scholars in the academy to be, uh, you know, our teachers. And therefore, we should, the professor, the president of the university uh, at UCC teaches a class still. 
um, as would the Vice President for Teaching and Learning, just to make the point that you don't lose contact with the grassroots. We need to identify support and reward those who teach superbly. So we have, you know, for example, teaching awards and ways of acknowledging staff. Um, and great teaching is indeed the form, as we've said, of synthesis of scholarship and research. Now I should say, the word scholarship, of course, is old, a medieval word. And things that stand the test of time are always powerful. It is a much older word than research, which actually only came about in the 19th century. The word scholarship gets across the notion of the scholar and his creativity. You know, and also that notion of time um, that links the two together. So therefore, that was what, why Boyer changed the word research. The common denominator is scholarship. And not in the sense of winning a scholarship financially, but the notion of being a scholar. And that one, in that sense, is a lover of learning, our own learning as well. But we learn through how we know our students are learning. And so it is, in that sense, a very beautiful idea, the notion of scholarship and its rich complexity. So now this is, I think, of, if, if you only had to take one slide today, this is the one. It's a quotation from Randy Bass, who is a scholar in the movement of the scholarship of teaching and learning that began in, uh, you know, in earnest after 1990. And he says, in scholarship and research, that's to say in the traditional kind of research, having a problem is at the heart of the investigative process. In science, for example, no doubt it'd be, you, you know, you, you are praised for having a problem. That's the whole idea, to find a better problem and a better question. But in one's teaching, a problem is something you want to fix very quickly. And we have got caught up, let's say, us not too much in the technology of the past in that micro-teaching, for example, where very often it was all the flaws, you know, why don't you look out more? You're not um, speaking loud enough. Your PowerPoint isn't clear enough. Or it was all about behavioral things. But whereas this is not what it's really about, nothing can be fixed easily in that way. That's a kind of a remediation role, as he says. So changing the status of the problem in teaching from terminal remediation, in other words, we're always fixing something. It's a training model. This is not a training model. It's a developmental model. So we're moving to ongoing investigation, where we're constantly questioning, hypothesizing, saying, yes, maybe that didn't work. Just like, you know the way the sportsman, I love that in sports after the match. Some of the greatest sportsmen in the world, but they take themselves apart saying, that was a disaster, I blew that there, that didn't work. That doesn't mean that just because it didn't work that they have lost their identity and they'll never play again. We must play on. And, but we get, you know, I think as well as educators, it's almost as if we can't get it wrong because we're supposed to be modeling the best practice. But of course, life gets in the way and things change and what works in one class does not work in another. And that's the glory of it. That's why you document it so that you see there, and it isn't about having a problem. Often you want to write something because, or picture it, because it worked so well. Why is it working so well? And then how can I do it again? Um, so it's not about beating yourself up or getting it wrong. Um, so this is what why I find, and this is what we have tried to do at UCC, is to start, you mentioned the word President earlier, constructivism. To be constructivist and start where the staff are. So it's not about, you know, so what are they bringing and then move on from there. So the movement in the scholarship of teaching is all about ongoing investigation. And that's where the common denominator is. If we are researchers, that's what we are. You see, if you speak to your colleagues as researchers first, I think that's key because we're all researching. The discipline, the to content, the topic, whether it's science or whether it's art or whether it's education. The discipline we are researching is mediated all of the time by an investigative process. So equally, our teaching is to be investigated. And this is a total false dichotomy. Um, that is now, that's why the power of the scholarship of teaching and learning movement is, is such. I mean, the conference now in, in um, San Francisco in... Um, 
November, October, October this year, you know, there will be a good five or six hundred delegates discussing these issues annually to try and see how can we get that balance right? How can we integrate research, teaching and learning? And a lot of it is the confidence building of saying, look, it belongs to everyone. Teaching and learning belongs to everyone. I don't have to be an educationalist to do it. I can use the research methods of my own discipline. And I can just turn my research hat slightly. But well, this time, what am I looking for? The evidence of student learning. Because whatever I'm doing, if they're not learning, my lecture might be fine, but I'm just talking to myself. Now, so of course, I mean, this is acknowledged that for many of the faculty, this is new terrain. So therefore, you may be an excellent teacher, but you have never treated your classroom itself, let's say, as the site of systematic inquiry, or indeed your virtual classroom. For many people are teaching online. So when I say classroom, I mean both, the virtual and the face-to-face. The -face. So they're framing their own teaching problems in this context now as questions of broader scholarly significance entailing a real shift in perspective and how that has played out in our staff in the master's program for example uh, what faculty do they write a, um, a portfolio uh, yes of practice all the way through but in the end what culminates in a publishable paper because i want them all to have a publishable paper at the end of it to show as well come full circle and see that how they integrate research, teaching, and learning. And a few of them would have published papers, for example, in Jay Sottle, the um, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning journal, on a variety of issues. So it's perfectly possible for us to research our teaching and put it out there, um, and to do so really along the way rather than at the end or in the middle of the night. Um, though we often are working, Noah and I, in the middle of the night. Now, Yes, just a, a, a note to show on how my, I'm not doing too well on my time wise. Am I okay? Yes, because I'm only, <laughs> I'm quite, I'm a long way to go yet. <laughs> Donald Schoen was the first one really in the academy um, who responded uh, and of course everyone stood up and, and sat up and listened because Donald Schoen is the guru for reflective practice and he said, listen, if Boyer is right, we have to have a new way of working in the academy. We have to have a new epistemology, as I said, new ways of knowing. And what is the new way of knowing? A kind of action research. And I love the way he uses the word, I don't quote it directly there, but kind of. Not because he couldn't be bothered thinking of something more precise, but rather that is precise. Because, of course, it depends on your discipline. The kind of action research as that, that will suit you will not suit Tali. It depends on your discipline. So that should give you confidence as well that you have the power within your own discipline to use the lenses of the discipline. And yes, there are some other useful um, strategies in education should you also need these. But your main thing is the medium you know, through which you give your students the message. Let that inform how you gather the data. Uh, because this is your class and your discipline and you're the expert in it. But to make it explicit and to go public and communicate with others, um, it's important for you to name all its parts. So it's like developing a grammar of your teaching that you need just to really kind of say and make explicit, you know, as Sean would have talked so much about that, about our, uh, and as well our espoused theories, um, but also the notion that we need uh, to make explicit. We have such excellent, um, ways of working that we develop over many years, but we never, they're a big secret, we don't let them out. Uh, now, so this thing of ultimately, we are talking particularly, for example, in the community, and that's where you are in the Faculty of Education, and I hear your president saying that, talking so uh, eloquently about that in the video that is on the YouTube uh, about Bitburl, you know, about you have a wonderful um, <coughs> clinical practice, and that is very much in the community. So, you know, action research is where, because ultimately it's not the poor man's research as it used to be thought of once. This is what it's all about now, and even the whole Bologna process and learning outcomes, it's all about what you do to understand, making that visible and actionable in the community, and particularly, you know, uh, for employability. And to, so we have to be thinking of 
action research as a key way forward now. And it is highly objective in the way in which it triangulates its evidence in many ways. We'll come to one small example in a minute. In a minute. Now, I'm only spending one slide on this. I have about 40 million of them, and I have to live it myself. But I have found the two lenses, but just I can't resist the opportunity to say so, of teaching for understanding extremely powerful. And you'll find all of that. I gave you the site link there to the Project Zero Classroom in the last slide, uh, but also the work of Howard Gardner and David Perkins and Martha Stone Weiske. Um, and uh, I, I was very lucky when I was at UCC first to be involved in a project that Noah mentions in passing earlier on, on multiple intelligences, curriculum and assessment. And I spent a whole decade there every summer as a member of that summer faculty giving courses um, uh, taking them myself the first year or two but then I had two courses to teach and it was a, a, a wonderful chance uh, and also people Howard Gardner would come and sit in the class or David Perkins and watch you teach and give you feedback so it was stellar stuff now but here you see to the front here knowledge now this is this is the gold dust this is the most important thing I think I've learned from that the wonderful thing about the Teaching for Understanding, TFU for short, is that though it was designed originally with um, the schools in Boston uh, around the Harvard area, uh, particularly at primary and secondary level, but of course because there were 30 researchers at Harvard involved as well, they had their research hats on all the time, and it is actually the most useful in the university or third level context in the teacher colleges and the universities. Because, of course, what they did, this was like the discovery of a constellation of new stars. It says every discipline, no matter which one, has the following four things in common. All disciplines have their knowledge. In short, what questions do experts ask? Okay, so we're all asking that. Then method, how do you think as a scientist? How do you think as an artist? How do you think, you know, as a mathematician? So the method of how you think, and that of course must map on to the pedagogy, and that's in the background, we come to that in a moment. And then the form. We must express ourselves in the full richness of, let's say, of the artwork. Not just in talking about it, but also in making it. Not just the exam paper, you know, we are, but the ongoing assessment. Um, so that we're not just calcified in forms, typical exam, MCQ, learn off, you know, but rather how to really be involved as we see in the project out in the hall. That's all you have to do is look at the project in the hall to see how ongoing assessment impacts how we should be going. And finally, purpose. Why? Why would you study this at all? That personal voice, that's what you give the A for. Ownership. The integrity of the work. And this, these are the four things that all uh, disciplines have in common. You know, and the purpose, it, it always comes to ethics, the atom. We can use it for good or ill. We have seen both. So looking in the background, just the four elements of the pedagogy, which I will um, mention briefly, it says if you teach to these four things, you know, you won't do too badly. One is generative topics, that our teaching should be generative and integrated, making connections. And so, in other words, look at that, the link with knowledge. That knowledge isn't splintered and broken, but generative. And again, uh, that we name in our understanding goals, that we're focused. We don't go into class just saying, grand, today I'll teach this old thing, now it'll do fine. Rather, our teaching is very focused and strategic. We have named our goals for them to understand. Not any old goals, ones where we can show that they will understand. And then, as it were, if we come to read the purpose next, the purpose, the performances of understanding. This is the key thing of that Harvard School that we have to do to understand. And in that sense, it foregrounds learning outcomes, but in a much more holistic way. So in the doing, and here, this is a, a, an academy that understands performance because it has an arts faculty. The doing, the make, and you know that any performance brings together so many things, you know, one's ability to present to the skills that that takes, but also the notion that in every performance you take a risk, you know, uh, and you have to be spontaneous, and you have to uh, have initiative. And so those things in learning, that creative impulse, that's at the heart of it. 
Um, so we need that, and I, as I say, we've seen a lovely moments this morning of this uh, uh, picture. There's the first picture that you'll see, you know, there's a globe, and then all the modern technology in front of it, the, the iPad, the phone, as well then as, you know, modern food like crisps and, um, you know, and, and the, the satchel that was there for a thousand years, you know, at the same time. So, and then other lovely um, images that we see in that exhibition where students are owning it, you know, where they have the screen, as you'll see, where it's like a selfie, you know, you see yourself, but what image, for example, does the woman get of herself in this very often? Young women are, in the culture, kind of affected negatively by, you know, um, the magnificent bodies. Uh, ten minutes, thanks be to God, because uh, I, need at least, I need another hour anyway, but however, I, keep, I do my very best with you. Now, just so we're now coming to the part, yes, where I need to say the other half of what I was going to talk about, as it were, is for that reason, where is the point of connection? Where can we get started? And it's with this assidere, from the Latin root, you know, to sit beside. This is what assessment is about, not to sit the exam, to sit beside your student. How do you do that, like in a class of 100 or 200, as well as in the class of one? But we're thinking here of saying, now you know this as educationists, but just, you know, when you hear me saying it, you see, I sound more foreign than Noah, so do you be able to take it in? Continuous feedback and continuous assessment. We are done with terminal assessment. This is, you know, a dinosaur now. We have to really have much more continuous assessment. And this is part of our planning. And when we are thinking of learning outcomes, for example, and the Bologna process and some of the work we are doing now in the light of um, working with Noah and, and um, Elena and Osnat and others in the project, we have to think about this. Oh, this is good. Excellent. Yes, I could drink a gallon of that in a middle of it. <laughs> so we're talking of assessment. Now, as I said to you, just, just think of the map. Boyer comes in 1990 with the notion of integrating research, teaching, and learning. And of course, that's around for centuries in some ways, you know. Uh, they got it right in the medieval context. And Harkness, uh, that man in Chicago way back in the 1900s, got it right when he said that all PhD students in the sciences should be teaching. So he was doing it. But in 1993, these two, Angelo and Cross, Thomas Angelo and Kay Patricia Cross, they immediately saw what Boyer was getting at and said, great, we have to come up now with quick, effective ways for teachers to start, you know, integrating their teaching and research, start classroom. So he calls it the cats. And I love this word because a lot of my students are medics, uh, you know, GPs and surgeons and all kinds of, of doctors and nurses. And they're all used to the cat scan. The cat scan. So I said, we have our own cat scan. And they said, so I give them, now we won't, we won't have time to go into too many of them in detail, I've just highlighted one or two, but that notion that this is the quickest, you can do this so quickly and get some, I mean, I have two or three colleagues who've written papers on this, in, on one or two cats they conducted. Now, in the context of it, just as Noah mentioned earlier, I'd say a little of the course. The course portfolio, I use the Hutchins model, particularly as they go, not in the first year as a teaching portfolio, but this is a most powerful model because it says, you see, at the heart of any course you're teaching, you have these three things. How you're designing it, then enactment, how you're teaching it. And the best way to teach it, as Tally says, is teach with your mouth shut. Get out of the way. Get out of the way yourself and let them at it. Facilitate it. And then finally, and I hear Noel talking of that as well, and the marvellous curriculum design she has in that course on diversity. So, you know, you're very clued in here already to all of this. Uh, and I'm just useful because coming from the outside, I see all the great work being done. But when you see it here, so then the results, ongoing assessment and student learning and learning outcomes. So you can put your cats, any, in fact, they will can go particularly in the last two under enactment and under results. You see, when you were doing the teaching, you were looking at how, how are they learning. And the same under results, let's say, it's, we're not looking only at exam results. It's too late. Too late when the exam comes. Um, and in Elena's work on the diversity that we talked of at UCC, there was one of the things that, came, you know, it's about how you're dealing with them. And how you're, you know, really getting them to change at the time. 
and how we'll say us and us in the technology we we'll use that to to really begin to inspire them you were saying earlier about the augmented reality trying to get them to look closer like visual thinking strategies now so for example these are some of my favorite cats the misconception one where i have a colleague who uh, uh, Declan Kennedy, whom some of you would have met, he teaches in the sciences, science education. He's constantly putting up, let's say, um, cartoons, you know, and the cartoon, if you like, it's from the work of Rosalind Driver and others in the sciences. Um, the cartoons kind of highlight all kinds of misconceptions, and the students have to work this out, and you can tabulate that, you know, for example. But this one, the memory matrix, I'll talk very quickly about um, my one of my colleagues doing this. She wanted to do a memory matrix. She's teaching in um, finance and uh, business. And what she wanted them to do, and she's also teaching them to do new packages, you know, about software development. And she wanted them to highlight this. So I might just try and see if I can read a moment from, from what she discovered. She's saying, I'm using the memory matrix as a guide to categorizing the data set received from students. Um, and this was performed using Excel. So she asked them to fill in this grid. And then she took it as a, she's a fine researcher in her own right. And she put it all into this grid. And she came out with six categories. Their description of their requirements, the description of the design, the techniques and other requirements, the techniques used at design level, the key outcomes of the requirements, and the key outcomes of the design. So all of a sudden, this thing that she was teaching now suddenly had six subcategories, and she could figure out exactly where something was going wrong because of this. So she says, after categorizing the data, I individually assessed key terms in each category using NVivo software. A word frequency search was first performed on each category, which provided word counts and a tag cloud. So she comes up with a whole lot then of, you know, images. Um, I couldn't take it out of the text, it was too awkward. But she creates, <coughs> uh, you know, wordles, in other words, to see what the students are thinking at each stage. And all from that simple thing. Of the memory. Now, there, there are several, if you key in 50 cats, loads of examples, I'll give you one anyway, um, Noah, the, the 50 cats are described in practically every university and teaching and learning centre uh, and summarised, so you can get loads of them there. Um, she, as she says, I'll skip on to the bit where she says, the matrix was good from the student's perspective in that it forced students to actually think more about what they had completed in various sessions overall, and more specifically, to recognize themselves that there is a link between the material they had covered and that it wasn't something completely isolated from last year as where she's worked. So integrative learning. After completing the memory matrix and having a group session, a number of students acknowledged that by doing the matrix, they had a better understanding of the material and the relationship among the elements documented in the matrix. From a lecturing perspective, I found the CAT very useful, and it allowed me not only to provide students with feedback, but also going forward to change the process of how the material is delivered in class. And I have one, as it were, final one on this um, and the minute paper. Uh, this guy, my other colleague, Tom Hennessy, he's a coach, as it were, in the Department of Applied Psychology. And um, he got them, he tried the minute paper, which you just asked them at the end of the class, what did you really understand today? What's still puzzling you? And he processed that. <coughs> and he just reading from his response, because he was annoyed. For, my initial response was annoyance. Very disappointing after all his work that those idiots didn't know what he was doing. And then quickly I decided to address the situation. The problem was me. I needed to bring back the information I had to the class in a way that the students would feel empowered, listened to, and that they would benefit from. So apart from the lecture then, this is what he did. I decided to make it all much more practical. I identified a video on YouTube that showed somebody using the GROW model. This was a model he was using with him, with a client. So my first response was to play that at the following lecture and to go through the four stages of what GROW means and then for each person in the class to identify how the various stages interplayed with one another. And this, of course, led on then to a role play whereby they were acting it through instead of him talking for 40 minutes at the top of the class about it. So, and he used, you know, triads and dyads, as he says, people in threes and twos. 
and he says in the end of it, the use of the minute paper engaged me to the point that I now want to use them all the time. So of course, we have to be careful, the caveat that, you know, you can't, don't overuse any technique. But he, um, he said, if I hadn't conducted it, and I think this is key, I would have happily believed that all my students had totally grasped the concept of the day. How wrong I would have been, and I never would have found out until the day of the exam. Too late, too late. Um, so finally, as I say on that one, the muddiest point, that's the same thing really, but just looking at the negatives. So even those three simple things you can research your teaching. Um, thanks, that's the longest, um, you're giving me more, definitely giving me more time. <laughs> so you can combine the two beautifully, the minute paper. and So there's a simple, three simple, they're misconceptions, what are they? Out the misconceptions. You know, and categorize them. Secondly, just take a one-minute paper. It takes maybe two, or I, I'd call it more than three-minute paper. But you know, you just ask them that question: What do you understand really well today? What's still puzzling you? And I use the. It is fascinating. What? And again, you see, it's acknowledging you as researcher. What comes out? And then again, you begin to see yourself separate from it, and not saying defensive or that why she, she should have understood that. What does she mean? But you see, when they're all telling you. This is like, in other words, it's a combination of assessment and evaluation. Why wait till the end to find out what the hell is happening in your own class? Now, I have to come to this before I go. Yesterday, this is how I learned the phrase, ne, you mean, because we are finding this place, okay? In what I call Caesarea and what is called Caesarea. Excellent, I'm doing, I, I, I'm nearly there. <laughs> now, First of all, let me speak, this, you see, the idea here, I want to talk about this symbolically as well, and what a wonderful day we had at that rally museum. If you haven't been, you must go, but no doubt you have all been there. Now, but this, is what I'm this is a symbol as well of our creative space. Sometimes we need to learn somewhere else. You know, to see your classroom as the creative space, and I, we have a gallery in the university, so I go, and you have one down the hall, I can see. Um, so I take the staff there so that they look again and look anew with fresh eyes at something, something they haven't come to before, and then take it apart. And you know, I use from that Harvard work a lot of the Project Muse, M-U-S-E. I can only name drop these things now because we haven't time, but it is a wonderful way of the faculty beginning to see what it's like to be in a situation where they don't know the answer in advance. You know, a new painting, some world, you know, and an emotional reaction as well. You know, so anyway, this is what we had. But I want to put, I want to come to two pictures. Now, I hope when I look up and see is this. Now, if you, this is called um, La Loca de la Casa. Now, I have no Spanish, but I, uh, you know, it is about like this, the house in the light of the location. Now. I think this is a wonderful metaphor. Have a look at the hands reaching out there of the building. See yourself in the center here, you know, at that building at the back, at the, in the background. And look at the two faces, right and left, and the hands reaching out and the, and the talking in the foreground and so on. Now, Noah and I had an interesting conversation about that yesterday, and I saw it more positively, um, let's say, and Noah was questioning more, she was more rigorous with it than I was, but I was thinking as well of today and how I could see it. Now, but this, you see, like, we have hands all over everything, is the thing. And the situation is always highly political and highly fraught. And I understand the, the teacher unions and issues as well that you have here. Um, so therefore, same in our own country, if that's any consolation, the ASTI, the Association of Secondary Teachers, are having great difficulty with the government proposals also. I spoke to them at Easter. So, uh, you know, it is a very, and teachers make a wonderful contribution, and it's very difficult to work out how to move forward. But all the time I'm thinking, you know, we are in a setting, but it's a global reach. And to me, you know, that, that kind of speaks to that. But finally, I thought this was an incredible painting. It's called, you know, The Circus. And it is written by, or composed by, uh, drawn by, devised, and indeed in some ways written, but particularly mm. beautifully given, by five artists in collaboration. Mm from, uh, we'll say, Chile, and from Uruguay, and from Spain. So what's fascinating is, you know, it's all, like we're never working alone. And I also wanted to leave that metaphor with the me metaphor of performance. And we are always making and remaking. We are always in the moment. 
out. And in that sense, I think the great thing about research is it's about infinite possibility. That the thing opens up, and we need to be playful in the best sense of that. My background, I suppose, as well is in drama, and I'm very conscious of that notion of play. That play isn't just mimesis, where one is imitating, but that in the very act of creating the moment, whether on stage or in the making of a play or the making of a piece of art, that you are fully invested on all the complex levels of your being. And unfortunately, sometimes in the workplace, our identities get fractured. You know, you're the researcher now and the teacher then. But you're both all the time. And the, the thing is, and I, I have in that sense played in that space myself, that, and to try and enjoy the journey and the experience, and not always to be so fraught with you know, the, the research in the more narrow sense of the end result and the, the, the research grant. But again, that culture has to change. We have to get more research for our teaching. We should be, I mean, if we get a research grant in teaching, then, as it were, that's where the research is. We shouldn't have to be bought out of anything. We are in the moment, in this wonderful place, and it is a circus in the best sense, you know, of a performance on many levels where we have to engage our students, who sometimes are like the wild animals, all going in every direction. And we have to hold them there and we have to, in some way, move forward. But I am, um, in, in closing, to say that it, it was wonderful to me, having seen this yesterday, to come in here, and only that I had no time to put it up, to see some wonderful artwork by the students in, in the hall here. And um, that that is the way you show, you see, so there is the performance and the playfulness. And it was interesting, Tally, to hear you speak, just as we chatted along, about naming the parts of your teaching. And you were doing so much research, maybe more than you realize, in the speaking of it. And, but you put it up there, and naming it in your critical pedagogy. And of course, the key thing is yet to get them to critique, and you step back. And Osnett, you talked of the same, in the light of looking at um, ways in which they could augment reality. You know. So we all need, as it were, in that broader sense, to augment reality. Our own reality of being, we must stop being two split people like. Um, researcher here and teacher there. We are one integrated whole. And, you know, we should, in that sense as well, I suppose I'll end by saying, we need to gift the learning to the learner. Let them do the work. And all we have to do really is just document it, photograph it, problematize it a little, ask them to tell us what they've learned. Ask them, they're the ones doing the learning. And that is the main locus of our research. And I wish you well with the day. I wish I had some Hebrew that I could hear you speak later. But I'm going to have a wonderful time um, seeing the rest of it. I'm sorry to have talked on so long, but it is a great pleasure to be here with you. I hope I didn't speak too quickly all the time. <laughs> I'll try by one more phrase. Um, let me see now if I can say the goodbye part. Um, don't don't prompt me now. Um, <laughs> La hetra otra. Yeah. Yeah.